Okay, so tonight we welcome Benedict Artler, founder of Activist Architecture Practice, Opposite Office. Uh, he studied architecture at TU Munich and at the Architectural and Design School in Oslo and later at the RD University in Dar el Salaam. Uh, after working for various architecture firms in Paris, Zurich and Munich, he took a leap in 2017 and created Opposite Office. Along with the firm, they, they work on challenging the inner workings of society and people's vision of architecture, reimagining art architecture's social and spatial visions. On another note, he is the publisher of various books. One of them, Reminiscence, published in 2016, is essentially the gold mine of inspiration for the firm. And with his work set between reality and fiction, one of his uh, outstanding projects would be The Affordable Palace, which I'm sure he will talk us through uh, in a bit, an actual dream, or the super hospital of fiction set in reality. Tonight, he will talk us through his vision of architecture, or rather the opposite of architecture. Uh, on to you, Benedict. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for this nice introduction. And Nicholas and Barbara, um, I didn't hear everything, Barbara, because your internet connection was, wasn't that good, I, I guess. But uh, I think it was a very good <laughs> introduction for my work. Uh, and I'm very happy to present uh, for you guys. And also what Nicolas said that it would be like, I would be like really interested uh, to also come physically and to see what you guys do at, at your school. Um, so that's why also at the end, I would be like, um, it would be very interesting to get in touch with you and also to hear your opinions and to discuss architecture with you guys. Um, actually, I wanted to present in French. I worked in the French architecture office, but uh, then I realized that my French is quite poor and I think I will stick to English. So maybe first um, I want to show you part of a French television. Il est 20h, bonsoir à tous, voici les titres de l'actualité de ce vendredi. Allons, la question du logement est toujours d'actualité avec des prix astronomiques qui placent la capitale britannique en tête des villes les plus chères d'Europe. Alors certains ont des idées pour y remédier, des idées, vous allez le voir, assez étonnantes. Et si on installait des logements sociaux pour 50 000 britanniques au-dessus du palais de Buckingham Une idée que la reine n'a cette fois pas commentée. Sur place, Arnaud Comte, Soulaine Grippon, Brice Boussoir. Construit au XVIIIe siècle, Buckingham est aussi bien la résidence officielle des souverains britanniques qu'un point de convergence du peuple et des touristes qui, par millions chaque année, prennent la pause devant les grilles et sous les fenêtres de sa majesté la reine. Alors imaginez un instant si cet emblème de 120 mètres de long et de 77 000 mètres carrés s'agrandissait encore davantage pour accueillir 50 000 londoniens qui aurait l'immense privilège de cohabiter avec la monarque. Une idée un peu saugrenue, mais bien réelle, que ce cabinet d'architectes municois a même mis en maquette. Le niveau du bas, c'est le palais actuel qui existe déjà. En blanc, au-dessus, c'est notre projet de logements sociaux. C'est une élévation. Cet architecte a même écrit à la reine pour lui exposer son projet inattendu avec lequel il entend enrayer la crise du logement qui frappe la capitale britannique depuis des années. L'un des rares endroits dans Londres qui n'est pas densément peuplé, contrairement au reste de la ville, c'est Buckingham Palace. Il y a 700 pièces, 70 salles de bain, mais presque personne n'habite dedans. Alors on s'est dit, ok, il faudrait utiliser ce potentiel pour obtenir encore davantage de surface de logement. Esthétiquement, on ne va pas vous mentir, le projet n'a pas l'air de séduire grand monde, même si certains badauds saluent la démarche. Ça sera des logements sociaux Je pense que rien ne serait plus égalitaire si on faisait ça. Mais ça ne serait pas forcément politiquement correct. Moi, je voudrais vivre au rez-de-chaussée, pas à l'étage. Dans l'esprit créativité, oui, je peux comprendre, mais je le verrais bien, mais je n'y pas. 
Ça vous plairait pas d'habiter avec la reine Non, pas non, du pas tout. Du tout. <rire> Pour les ennemis de la monarchie comme Graham Smith, qui milite depuis dix ans contre la famille royale et pour l'abolition des privilèges royaux, ce projet de logement sociaux à Buckingham irait dans le bon sens, selon lui. On dépense des millions pour entretenir la résidence d'une seule personne, alors que des dizaines de milliers de personnes à Londres n'ont pas les moyens d'acheter leur maison. La famille royale n'a pas confiance de la difficulté de se loger dans ce pays et d'être étranglée par les prix. Pour ceux qui estiment que ce serait un crime de lèse-majesté, rassurez-vous, ce projet dans les faits n'a quasiment aucune chance d'aboutir. Il s'agit surtout de sensibiliser sur le manque de logements abordables dans la capitale britannique dont les loyers figurent parmi les plus onéreux d'Europe. Ok, j'ai juste montré ça parce que c'était en français. Je pense qu'ils l'ont expliqué ou ils l'expliquent mieux que moi. Et maintenant, je vais commencer avec ma présentation. Vous voyez ma présentation Oui. Oui, ok. So, um, as Nicolas and Barbara said, I'm an architect uh, from Munich. I have a small studio, which is in Munich. So you have here a picture with me and one of my collaborators, Jonas. Um, the picture was taken by the great Thomas Hasler, who is my long-term um, collaborator, who also worked uh, at my office while he was studying. And, um, I want, I mean, uh, you learn a lot in your architecture school, but one thing what you don't uh, learn is how to start your own office or also how you get your first commissions. And uh, that's what I want to show you today. And also I want to show you some of our latest projects. And thank you again for the invitation, Nicolas. Um, and we can start with this one. So what is, what is the opposite office? Um, and that maybe it comes from, let's say as a young architect, you have maybe three possibilities to start your own business and to get commission. So the first one is you are rich or you have rich friends, rich family. And then you just start with your first project and then maybe you get commissions afterwards um, because the first project is your reference. Then the second possibility is that you work like hard in office, maybe five, 10 years. And then at the end, um, you just take or rec recruit one of the clients from your old office where you worked and The third um, possibility is just your, if you're lucky. And yes, you heard right. In architecture, it's not, everything is not about talent. So it's more about knowing the right people. And as I said, as a young architect, it's very difficult. Um, also like if you want to do uh, competitions, uh, mostly you participate with a lot of other architects So the chance of winning is quite low when you when you have like 200 other offices on this competition. And mostly even to take part in one of these competitions, you also have to have built a lot. So the clients, they don't want young, fresh ideas, but they want uh, reliability and seriousness. So for instance, for a competition for a school, you already have to have built like five schools in the last five years and then you can participate. So the system always generates itself and creates like large architectures, offices, large uh, structures. Uh, and then when you work there, you maybe you are like a very specialized person who will deal only with window details for the next five years. And I don't like this large um, structures. So uh, maybe there's also like a, a third or like a fourth uh, possibilities um, to start your own office. And sometimes it also works through boldness, audacity and provocation. And that's the way I want to show you.
today. Um, this is, was the first competition we did. Um, like what I did as a self-employed architect, it was like maybe like three years ago. And it was a competition about affordable housing in London. Um, and since I said that there will be like several hundred architects who participate in these types of open competitions, I was very sure that we will be, or it will be impossible to win um, as an architectural rookie. So we just wanted to have fun. So we just wanted to enjoy ourselves and don't have the pr pressure to win. We proposed um, to transform Buckingham Palace into affordable housing. And as expected, we didn't win the competition, but we got attention by the British press. Um, we have a view on, on the interior side of this um, social housing project. And the Daily Mail and other junk papers published articles about our proposal. And like there were, were a lot of um, publications. So um, it also came across the, the, the canal. And as you saw, it was in the French eight o'clock news. And so it, there was just a matter of time when the royal family read about our idea in the news. And then the queen invited me to London uh, and to present our idea. Here we have um, the staircase of the project. And that's why I got invited by the Queen. So I'm just waiting there with all the other tourists uh, to get into the Buckingham Palace and um, waiting for my audience. And then I had 10 minutes where I could present my work. And it was, and then the Queen was actually, she was very impressed uh, about our work. And then she commissioned us with a feasibility study to explore the potential of Buckingham Palace. And I mean, Buckingham Palace is great. It has um, 775 rooms and 79 bathrooms. And actually this is not very representative uh, to the population density in, in the rest of London. So we found a lot of unused potential. And then after one year of planning, um, the Queen came to our office in Munich um, and we presented to her a big scale model. It's, I think it's like a one to 100 or one to 200 uh, model. And we presented her our idea mm -hmm. and also there she was quite impressed. So um, I will show you this project. But first of all, I have to say that designing like social housing the budget is always very limited. So on kind, we were focused for radical cost savings. And this is actually the best what I can explain at this floor plan here, because in general, you can say that this floor plan is not like designed kind of in aesthetics, but it is more designed from rules of cost efficient um, building. So the first thing where you can save costs in, in cities is always the land costs. So if you use an existing structure, um, this will save you a lot. So we found the structure of the um, parking plus. The second one uh, is the circulation area. Normally in houses, you have a lot of circulation, sometimes like 30, sometimes even in, in, in cultural uh, projects, like 40% of circulation area. So we try to reduce this to absolute minimum. What you can see here in this plan is that we have only nine staircases. This is like the dramatic or the only part where we wanted to design and, and, and to have some um, aesthetics inside. But they are like the, the arrangement just comes from the fire protection rules. So that's a minimum way what you need uh, in like what is written in the British building laws. But also then going 
into the rooms or into the apartment itself, we tried to reduce the circulation area. And we even tried to avoid it completely. So what you can see here is that we have, well, we, we looked at the history and then we had like an inspiration in, in, in the Baroque stylistic um, device of the enfilade. I guess you also in French people love it. So it's like when you have this rooms without any hierarchy, without any um, circulation area, and they are all all the same same space. Um, yeah. So um, we have, don't have any hierarchies, and this also leads us to the next point of affordable housing, which is also that you have to build flexible. Um, because you don't know what the future brings and, and, and how can the house transform itself over the time. And therefore, it's also like good if you have rooms without any hierarchy and you can just, um, or the people can use, use the house very differently. That's part of the structure. So we have a skeleton structure, which allows uh, different uses. And at the end um, with this, um, we achieved only 10% circulation area. And as, as I said before, like when you compare it to other housings, you will be saved about 20 or 30%. And next point of being very affordable and to, to build cheap is to have like a compact building. So we have a compact building structure that has a very good correlation of exterior wall and the surface of and, and compared to the building volume. So this saves expensive facade surface and construction costs as well. And it is also, of course, it is economic um, use and the maintenance and energy consumption. So the next point of being affordable, affordable is the, the energy thing. Um, I mean, or also like, like the standardization. So it's very important to have um, standardization in the for, for affordable housing. So you absolutely have to avoid individualization. The worst thing you can do as an architect is to listen to the special requests of your client. Don't even start with it. Like when it when one starts, you have to redraw all your plans um, and it's just like a waste of time. Um, so we designed only one bathroom, one a living room and one bathroom. And we, then we just copied it. That's another maybe tip for you guys, um, how you can um, work as an architect is always you have to scale your projects because I don't know if it's the same in, 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 in France, but I guess, yes. So in Germany, like you get your fee is always depending on the cost of the house. So if you have high costs, uh, you get more fee by yourself. And if you just scale the things, the costs are going high, but you don't have to design more. So um, that's what we also tried to do there. Um, yeah, and then you always have to make sure that the, the money flows. So don't let exploit yourself as architect, always be economic because other professions are doing this the same. So the last uh, thing, what I want to show you for the points of uh, affordability here is the, techn technolo the, the building technolo technology. So we also tried to reduce this. And because I think our buildings and these times are much too comfortable. Um, once we were hunters and gatherers and fought against saber-toothed tigers and mammoths. And today we are anguish super boars and sit only in our thermally isolated plastic houses with mechanical ventilation. And so we just forgot all about this, and that saved us about 20% um, as well. So you see um, the design 
is um, here again, you see like the circulation which goes through the old palace and then um, the social housing top, which is like a lightweight structure as a skeleton uh, construction. And here we have can look a little bit deeper into the apartments. As I said, you enter the apartment and you just have rooms without any hierarchy. But of course, you have the more public rooms in the middle and the private rooms on the outer facade. So you can generate on one hand completely public house, but you also, if you want to sleep, you can just close the doors and you have your privacy. And that's also maybe the last big point of uh, design, designing affordable housing is that you have like a shared economy, like here in this apartment, you share the bathroom, you share your living room, and that just generates more space for yourself because you don't, or for instance, the kitchen, you don't need the kitchen every day. So it, it's no matter if you just um, share it with other people. So you see, at the end, this is a very profound and academic approach to affordable housing. So we just took these rules and we just uh, did it without any own, um, let's say, uh, aesthetics what we wanted to achieve. So just um, like the project is doing itself. And, but um, of course, this is, um, our design doesn't only met with admiration and I don't want to throw the critical points with you of contemporary international architecture criticism. So there was, for instance, I can just read it out. Why are German designers using the buildings for affordable housing? Shows how much money the time those grabbers have on their hands. Well, it's not about money, I guess. Uh, it's more like when you when remember what I showed you at the beginning, the, the pigeon at the beginning that said that opposite of office is spare time and fun. So it wasn't actually about, uh, about money. Um, the next one he says, one has to wonder if these are publicity stunts by companies to generate free publicity at no cost, as opposed to using it on enormous annual advertising campaign. So first of all, actually in Germany, it is forbidden as architect to advertise. So, and of course I'm like, I'm state supporting and law abiding. And also I don't really know if this really, if this is a advertising which really helps me to generate um, new projects. So why wasn't this awarded to British firm so much for loyalty? I think this comment was before um, Britain left the European Union. So I think today it, it changed his opinion. Uh, didn't the German wannabe architect make plans for London? The little guy with the mustache? Whoa, um, actually when I read, read this, I was like very, um, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I, because I, I didn't really know why do the heck do they know that I have a mustache? So um, yeah. And the last one is that bet this company is about to become insolvent, and this is the very last PR stunt. So um, actually, I have to disappoint these critics uh, because my business is currently going way good. But after this, let's say, uh, success of the affordable palace, we tried to transfer this whole thing to a German project. Uh, but the problem in to design something in Germany was always that we came against the barriers of the German building law. So in order to build that, what we really wanted to build, first we had to change the law. And so um, we did um, a proposal or we, 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 we did an, we say it like, like anti-Mustaba Ordnung, which is like an anti-building law. And this anti-building law only has 10 paragraphs. 
and all the paragraphs should support affordable housing. So one paragraph, for instance, allows uh, temporary structures on gabled roofs. And that's why we also like did a one project for this. And we did a project where you can see here, it's a temporary structure, which uh, is on top of, or can be placed on top of gabled roofs. And it's like called the affordable loft. It's uh, for students. So it's a very cheap, a lightweight structure for young people and you just so if you come to a city you don't have to rent the expensive apartment when you go there for study you just bring your or you just buy yourself one of these affordable lofts which is like 20,000 euro but then when you move and I, I mean young people they move a lot then you just take it with you it takes about half day and then you can just go with the car and uh, transport it to another point. And I mean, also from the top, you have like a beautiful view over the city. And then we just um, did this for like for Munich, first of all, and we just counted the gabled roofs we have. And it was like, if you just have like every second gabled roof, you knew if you would use there one of these affordable lofts, um, the whole German housing crisis um, would be over. Um, but actually, I don't want to bore you with all this affordable architecture anymore. So let's have a look at a cultural building. This was a competition uh, we did for a maritime museum in, in Portugal. It was an international competition. But instead of pleasing the client, wish for a museum, we proposed or we planned a recycling, um, like a plastic recycling plant on the ocean, what you can see here. Uh, and I think, because I think we already intervene enough in the sea habitat. So instead of fulfilling the given program, we decided a lousy recycling plant that fishes all the plastic waste out of the sea. This recycling plant actually produces recycled boats where you can then explore the ocean. And let's have a look at this um, structure itself. So you see the recycling plant in the middle and then you have all these rooms we also need for the recycling um, process. And then in the, in the middle, you get this produced um, recycled boats where you can just spend a beautiful day and then go back and don't, uh, and, but, but go back with a good feeling. So you don't have a bad feeling and you just know, okay, I did something and I just picked some plastic waste out of the ocean. Um, and again, unfortunately, our proposal could not achieve first place. Um, so sometimes clients, they don't like it if you ignore completely their competition assignment. So. Maybe we have to find a way which is um, doing both, like um, trying our or trying to give input also what we can improve, but maybe it shouldn't completely ignore all everything. Um, the next project is a proposal for a redesign of the main airport in Germany. And we tried to redesign it as a COVID-19 super hospital. In Germany, we really know how to build major projects. I mean, made in Germany is a really, it proves high quality, efficiency and innovation. So Germans are reliable, willing to work hard and carefully. It's not like, like maybe in French where you have this lazy laid back life it's like very uh, tough life. So um, we had this masterpiece of German engineering, which is a German airport in Berlin called the BER. Um, but unfortunately, this airport um, was under construction since 16 years and it always got more expensive. So every year they said it will be 1 billion more expensive. And, and then on, on the other side, you have this white 
span of time we have like 16 years of building but also before this you need the time of planning and before this you need the political political time of planning so it's maybe like half a decade until this construction will be finished from the first point to the end and i think like the world that changes very fast so right now we have pupils that are going on the streets and protesting against uh, climate change and the pollution and we in Germany like we're building the third and, and fourth um, airport so is this really going to happen and I thought like in every crisis there also lies an opportunity a opportunity for a change maybe for a more ecological lifestyle and I thought like COVID-19 now we have the potential like to propose to use this climate killer which wasn't actually open at that time but was finished a long time like it was finished but there were some problems about fire protection since some years so you could actually use it but after the law there were just then some points where you have to fix and like i think there was a potential that in crisis you can change something so we tried or we made the proposal uh, to change it into a hospital, COVID-19 hospital. What you can see here um, is that we designed one of these intense care units, which is a modular system. And also there we thought like we will build it like a very easy way um, so that it can be built up very, very, very fast. And also we tried to, like the arrangement tries to have this um, spatial separation because of um, COVID-19. And um, here you see this um, modular system. The circular shape is actually this ideal for spatial isolation. But also here, unfortunately, this project didn't find a client either. And right now, or like in the time of coronavirus, they finished the airport. And, but then like the planes couldn't fly and the state just uh, had to give tax money uh, to the airport just to um, let it stand still without doing anything. The next project is also, we had a very unusual client. Um, this time it was the US gover federal government and the United States Congress. So um, I think you remember in this year, I think it was the 6th of January, where some um, angry American patriots um, stormed the Capitol. And America and the whole world looked very skeptical and very frowned on these people. So the, the press the, the um, titled um, Attack on Democra Democracy. And I think, but instead of this indignation, we asked ourselves how we can protect our democracy. So after much deliberation, we came to the conclusion that walls always help. So we designed, this is the existing um, capital, and we designed a wall around it. And the wall is inspired by historic castles. And we proposed this 1.5 meter thick wall to be in recycled uh, bricks. Um, also here readers from architectural magazines were outraged again. I don't know, they said like unimaginative and diligent, loosey Photoshop skills, poor research, just to name a few comments. And also, and, uh, but th then we produced um, like a movie which will be shown in Milano at the Architecture Film Festival. So um, just like a very loosey, very poor, um, fast uh, movie. But also like the people, as, as I said, I will also show you the critics. So um, maybe you can read this by your own.
And if you want, you can, of course, also either if you want, I can show you the, the small clip about Capital Castle, or you can just um, Google it at uh, YouTube. Um, and at the end, when you look at our projects, you realize that actually that doesn't really have much to do with architecture. Um, of course, we produce plans, models, and we are selling on this whole thing as a very serious architecture work. Um, but what is like, or we're calling it like opposite architecture, opposite office, but what is opposite? And um, for me, the question is more like, what, what is architecture? What is architecture? So um, maybe architecture is always, in my opinion, it is, first of all, this is the formulation of a problem. And then secondly, I also think that architecture is always about the future. But when we look at our times uh, and you see the, like how politics react to the problems of our time, which is affordable housing, which is climate change, which is the unequal or the unequal payment of people. And, but politics, they never react like almost only like very small steps. And we only have a very short term where we look like we don't look what's happening in 10, 20 years. So we all politics only looks what's happening tomorrow. And I think architecture has the potential to look uh, farther in, in, in the future. And so um, I think you can um, define architecture somehow differently. And for me, the question is if architecture is like all of us, this fancy architecture, if this really helps us um, to get ahead. So um, I think at the end, um, everybody has to define architecture by herself, what, what, what architecture is and what architecture should be. And I would be glad if we have a discussion about this. So what, what is architecture for you? Because I mean, you guys are the next generation. You are the guys who will uh, also have to solve all these problems, what, you, what we have, these worldwide problems. So I think um, as an architect, uh, we have a very important role. One thing, what is when you just have to look back in history, you can see that the big architects um, from like, like Le Coupis, no, not like, like ages ago, they always also had something in mind about the, the society. But right now we just um, have, or just do what our client wants. So I think, and, 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 and for instance, um, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, they are like um, telling us that they are the IT architects and then they are like designing the society. But I think we have to take something over again and to take some of this power that architecture also has in kind of political and uh, social aspects and just take some of this power back and just to get involved. And I Love think architecture is what you want architecture to be. Um, thank you very much. And I'm very open for a discussion. Thank you very much, Benedict. Um, I don't know if people want to react or ask questions or comments. Um, how long ago did you did you launch uh, your uh, your office? Uh, I think I started in um, two thousand eighteen, but I'm also like teaching at university. Um, which is like uh, two two days a week, so that I also have have like a base at at the beginning. Okay, and would you would you define like your practice as being a mix of like uh, teaching, uh, working at the office, and doing other stuff, or um, uh, or you like uh, are you considering yourself as being an architect that works uh, for uh, for your own office, and and that's your. Uh, uh, how, how you define uh, yourself or is it something that uh, you define more as um, many different uh, um, uh, stuff that comes together? Um, no, I think like 
like having one foot in the in the university is quite a good thing because you know getting older and then you just always have the contact to the young people like uh, hearing what is um, <laughs> oh, what is coming up <laughs> in this direction and it also makes you kind of a little bit more free so that you don't have like I mean if you just be self-employed you don't have to maybe think about your own stuff and if somebody comes and says okay I want I want you to design my single family house here and I want to have it like this 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 then you can't say no I, I don't want to do this you have to do this then so I think it's about freedom uh, and especially at the beginning as I said there are like three options when you how you want to make yourself self-employed I don't have rich um, family so that was not an option and so you need to have like some some income as well so that is uh, also I think is a very important thing of being at the or working at the university but uh, at, and it also makes fun I mean it's um, it's um, it's nice so your university uh, job oh, sorry yeah no fine uh, so would you say that your university job uh, and having an outside income allows you to do things you wouldn't be able to normally do, uh, be a little more provocative than you usually would? I guess so, yeah. yeah that's nice. But um, like we're doing like serious architecture stuff uh, and just like, you know, like also like building something takes a lot of time. So when you, like for instance, when you win a competition, uh, it sometimes takes four or five years until you see something. So that's why um, you also have to take your time. Um, and and like if you have your own office, you don't have to believe that it's like in one, two years and then you, then you will have success, but you always have to stay to it. Can I ask you what was the hardest part uh, for you, like uh, concerning like starting your uh, your studio? Like, uh, what what was the most like challenging part of uh, the beginning of the, the creation of this uh, agency? Um, I think the hardest point maybe is like, for instance, when you, I told you about our first project, what we did, that we did it, but we did it. Uh, with the knowledge that we don't win. So you know you're producing a lot of time, a lot of, uh, <laughs> also like a lot of um, yourself in this project, but at the end, you you know, you it's not gonna happen anything. So that's maybe one big point. And also, I guess, I don't know if it's the same in, in, in France, I guess it's similar, but in Germany it's like very hard for this, um, I mean, you have like, um, I don't know um, what, how to say this, um, but he has all, all, all this law stuff. So um, when you're designing something uh, and something is going wrong, maybe with one foot, you are already in the jail. So you have, uh, and you have to know a lot, but you can't, you can't know everything. So I just know from one architect, he, he I guess he was got self-employed when he was 30 and then he built um, um, an underground garage and then after 20 or after 30 years there was um, water going in and at the end uh, he had to pay I don't know 300 or 500 thousand euros uh, because he didn't have the right insurance or the insurance uh, didn't want to pay so we have always like the financial thing is like it can be tough. Okay. Because every architect, you never can you never can know everything. And in Germany, and I think it's the same in French, in France, you have so many laws, uh, but you can't know everything. So you're always doing something with kind of a half knowledge, and you just have to relax and 
uh, sleep good with it. And, and this maybe you have to learn this. I also had a question. Um, because you sort of put a strong intent on the comments you received on your different projects, and I know as a student, it's always really hard to take criticism when you first start into architecture. How does that translate once you move into the professional world? How do you deal with critiques? Uh, well, um, the first project was um, the Affordable Palace thing, and then it was published in Daily Mail. And you know, in Daily Mail, it's like, I don't know, like, uh, like, um, very tough people or like uh, people who have like strong opinions <laughs> read uh, the Daily Mail and, and then there were like more than 1000 comments under this article and I just showed, showed you some and when I read it first it was like uh, very I got very frightened actually at the beginning because there were like very tough comments. And also I got emails from people who said that uh, they want to kill me and all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> but this was like a, like a tough school. So for the next projects, it's, it's, it's easy going because uh, I know when you provoke, you will get a feedback, which is like a bad feedback, but also you get, get a good feedback. And since like we're doing international project, projects also, like I'm not afraid going out of my door. Uh, so um, I think it's, it just takes a time and then you just don't take it as serious um, as you do it, like when you read it the first time. Okay, thank you. Architecture as a tool for social and political activism. However, do you find that it's ever a limitation in what you want to achieve? And if so, how do you combat it? Um, so first of all, I, I think like that, that architecture is a very good media. Um, and every, or like many other like artists, they, they using stuff to, to set their themes. And I think that the problems in our world, they're like, we have so big problems. We have uh, climate change and, and, and other stuff, but oh, like we, that's not like that's, that's that's coming to everybody. So you can, I can't just say, okay, I, I'm not dealing with it uh, because at the end it will, I also live on this planet. And so that's why I think we have to engage. Uh, and also um, I think some of my projects, they just like, they are provocative, but at the end, just people talk about a uh, topic. And then, for instance, I got invited for an interview, and then I can just say something, what I wanted to say. But otherwise, without the project, I couldn't have said this. So I got a lot of interviews in political magazines in, in Germany. And I would never have been there without the project. So as, as I said, it's more like having this project as a background for just intervening and just to saying something like, because I think there are some social themes where everybody has to say something about this. And I think at least in Germany, uh, like the politics, they are always dealing in this very small, or it's very, it's also in the European Union, it's very difficult to change the big thing. So you're always dealing on this very small screws but the end, this will not help us. So we have, at, at some point, we have to also make big changes. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. I have a question. I was wondering, why did you decide to settle or create your office in Munich? Because you seem like you've been about and you like, uh, you have interest in different places, but why choose Munich? Was it because of the policy or was it just because you felt like Munich is home? Well, it's not that I choose, I, I, yeah, it's just, uh, <laughs> I live here. <laughs> that's not, um, that's the only thing. I think, uh, I think there are many nice places to live. Uh, as I said, I also lived in Paris, but just like a short time. Then I was working there in the office and 
at the beginning, like the, the boss told me what to do. And he was talking so fast in, in French and I didn't understand anything. And then I just asked again. And then he said the same stuff, but double uh, this fast. And so for me, and, and I mean, there are many places where it's nice to live, but at the end, I just have some friends here and it's just my home. But um, it's not that I decided that I want to stay here for my whole life. So um, I'm still open, but of course, right now I'm also having projects uh, which are like nearby and then you just can't move uh, this easy anymore. So um, we see what the future brings, but I don't guess I will live my whole time in Munich. Yeah. Thank you. I, I have another question. Um, so you, you, so you just started your thing, and you have like uh, your partners that, that I guess are uh, young as well, and you all like getting uh, getting started. Um, and um, um, how do you um, how do you work with with others in order to to like create these projects that have like um, uh, this like boldness uh, and and which is like. Uh, Politically uh, uh, engaged when um, when maybe you all have different opinions and so or some sort of stuff and so how do you do you work with with others how do you exchange and how do you uh, uh, like take actions uh, in those projects how, how do you work as a as a team? Okay, so first of all, mostly well, most projects you have to be like very fast. For instance, the project for the Capital Castle, you had like the storm on, on on the capital and then you i know that maybe you have like six or seven hours <laughs> because when it takes like two weeks it will be over nobody will be interested in this so actually this is more like uh, i don't know it, 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 it's like i'm just somewhere no matter where i am and i just uh, I, I saw the news and i just started to do this and this is just like, and also like the critics say it. So it looks like somebody just like a student spent some hours uh, and did this with very lousy um, Photoshop skills. And actually that's how we work. So it's not like that we have a, um, like a process. So it's more like a reaction on something. And then at the end, it depends if you, um, so maybe like, for instance, we got like invited for this, um, like for a biennial, architectural biennial. Then of course we try to reproduce um, the stuff and to create more fancy or ma fancy models and um, plans. So we also like doing work after the project um, just for the presentation. But it's a very mostly it's a very fast and very um, it's not like a like a semester project where you have critics uh, every week and can work for three months uh, on this. And also, I mean, you don't get money for this, so you have to be fast. Uh, and I also have to pay my collaborators, so I can't like <laughs> say okay, let's let's do a project and we have half a year and we. Um, yeah, that's not, not how it works. <laughs>